Hey, this is Tall Tale Kill from Sir Gentleman. Today I'm showing you the classic point click adventure game from Sierra Online, Shivers. This game was released in 1995 on CD ROM, which actually was still fairly new at the time. The game is pretty standard first person point click, but has some really interesting tech and atmosphere behind it that makes it one of my favorite games of all time, much less my favorite adventure game. One of the first things about this game is that it was published by Sierra Online. This is a company that no longer exists, unfortunately, as it was absorbed by Activision. They still hold the IPs for all the games, but I really doubt they'll actually do something with it. But this Sierra made some really amazing adventure games in the late 80s and 90s. Games like Gabriel Knight, Police Quest, King's Quest, Rama, which is relatively unknown, but for sci-fi junkies, it's really awesome. So this is based off of the Arthur C. Clarke book, Rendezvous with Rama. And the puzzles were designed by a mathematician, so they're all very math-oriented puzzles. So for a science geek like myself, it's kind of cool. But last, though, it made Phantasmagoria, which Phantasmagoria believes the mood for Shivers a year earlier when it was released, since it brought a little notoriety to the PC gaming world. It was had an extremely messed up story to it, and downright graphic, gory, screwed up cutscenes. It's an extremely brutal game, and I think Shivers jumped off of that platform. Shivers, on the other hand, focused more on gameplay and puzzles rather than a long, linear story that Phantasmagoria had, but it definitely set the mood. Shivers, though, suffers from the first-person point-click adventure game disorder of having absolutely terrible opening scenes. I referenced this game in my last video of what not to do in an opening cutscene for first person, and I'd show you the scene, but DOSBox cutscenes and fraps don't seem to get along very well. The scene was very abrupt, kinda cheesy, and as a symptom of the live action craze of the 90s, had horrendous acting. Although it is good for something, you get a great view of early 90s clothing, and it's a wonderful thing indeed, actually. In fact, the game is chock full of 90s culture we all take for granted, like analog tape recorders, address books, and live action cutscenes. Have I mentioned how much I hate live action cutscenes? Anyways, the plot is pretty solid, because there really isn't much of one, just not to make it interesting and explain why the hell you're running around a museum solving ridiculous puzzles. The game starts as a presumable high schooler dared to spend the night in an unopened museum of Professor Wunderlatt, aka the crazy obsessed archaeology professor. This happens to be where two teens went missing some years ago as well, and joked about maybe the professor killed the two. Plot hole number one. Where the hell were the police? This entire time and no cops investigated the place? Like, hmm, well these teens went into this museum that's been abandoned and some crazy douchebag lives in there. Eh, those silly kids. Uh, they'll sure turn up at some point. And no no cops ever want... Yeah, we should probably, you know, investigate. Everyone seems to know they went to the, the castle, but, you know, I guess police don't actually investigate things in the Zero Online universe. Never mind they're the ones who made police quest and SWAT. Huh. Anyways, continuing. Upon some initial investigation after getting into the museum, by solving a few puzzles of course, you find out that the evil Xubi, which are ancient Incan spirits, are released by the two teens. You find out via the ghost of the professor. Plot hole number two! It seems that the professor was killed by the Xubi first. It doesn't really say it, but it kind of made evident that apparently he was killed first. But he was killed before the teens got there, but the teens in their journal say that they found the Exupi seals in their vessels and that they unsealed them. So, wait a minute. Who died first? Anyway, the two kids died, the professor died, everyone dies. Yay, yeah, it's all happy. It's up to you to find the Exupi and put them back in their containing vessels, or they might be released into the world. Oh no! Why is it taking them something like eight years to do that, I have no idea. The professor even mentions that one already escaped. Now, I haven't played the second one much. I played like five, maybe ten minutes of it. It takes place in the desert Nevada from where you start out at something like that, but I'm not sure. 
think it might have something to do with the Escape Exupi, but I have no idea. Um, haven't really played through it. It's one of these things I've been meaning to do. Anyways, that's essentially the plot. To accomplish your task, you're given free reign, essentially. The entire museum is completely non-linear, and the gameplay consists of completing puzzles to unlock rooms in the museum. Conveniently, the professor thought it would be a good idea to, you know, make every room in the entire museum have to be opened by solving a puzzle. Convenient. Now, you unlock doors to get into other parts of the museum, and in those parts of the museum, there are exhibits that have puzzles in them that hide pieces of the exupy vessels. These consist of a pot with a matching talisman. Each pot corresponds to one exupy, which is associated with a particular element. Now, to accomplish your task, you're given free reign of the entire museum. It's completely nonlinear, and gameplay consists of completing puzzles to unlock rooms in the museum, which conveniently the professor thought, hey, you know, it'd be a good idea to make every door locked, and the only way to unlock them is to solve a puzzle. Yes, that gets me off. How convenient. Now, you go to these random rooms, and each room or exhibits that consist of all kinds of really weird shit. Now, each of these co uh, each of these exhibits have exupy in them. You solve the puzzle, you get a lock and exupy vessel, which these consist of a pot with a matching talisman. Now, each pour each pot corresponds to one exupy, which is associated with a particular element. You spend the entire game looking for matching pieces. Then you find the corresponding exupy, capture it, and return it to the exhibit. Which... Apparently you decide... Gee... Maybe, uh... Maybe I should uh, do something with these, like... Bury them, or something. <laughs> nah, I'll just put them back in the exhibit and wait for the next dumbass to wander in here and release them. Or even better, wait till the whole place gets bulldozed and they all just get released and their talismans crushed and made to powder and released into the entire world. Even better. Anyways, I'll show you a quick example of, uh, give you an example of one of the puzzles in this game here. Uh, the majority of them are fairly solvable without having to resort to a guide, although there's one that's just notoriously difficult. This one's one of the easier. This is an alchemy machine. But not stick in. Go. I've ever mentioned that this is definitely one of my favorite pieces of the game. Come to our museum! Don't touch the exupy things and have your life sucked out. Anyways, that was one of the puzzle examples. Graphically, though, the game is gorgeous. It consists of something like 2,600 individual scanned watercolor images that make the screens an all of them attribute to the game's atmosphere incredibly well. They're all very dark, even in places that are supposed to be pretty bright, they, they still manage to be dark, and it's really good. The animations, on the other hand, they're... they just completely ruin the experience. First, you have the absolutely terrible live-action capture scenes, which they're just so blurry and low resolution that it's not even worth it at some points in the game. I don't even know why they did it. Second, you had the exupy at 
hack animations, if you can call it that, which are just uh, horrendous. They uh, they completely ruin it. But I'll show you that as well as an example of the music. But the music is probably the best part in the entire game. Honestly, I absolutely love the music. It it's probably one of the strongest contributing factors to the game's atmosphere, which this entire game, all the creepy bits of it, are all reliant upon the atmosphere, and it's the strongest piece of that atmosphere. So, I'll show you a few examples of music, as well as the animation. Room has a different soundtrack to it, and I absolutely love some of the music on it, some of it's really just kind of mellow and just good. And some of it are just downright creepy for the time, considering that soundtracks, again, weren't that huge of a thing with these games at the time. They just kind of weren't there. You know, if Mist, definitely one of the groundbreakers of this type of genre, had virtually no music in it. But this one, each and every room, has a complete unique soundtrack to it, and I absolutely love it. So, here are a couple examples of some of the rooms. This is the main lobby. example of some of the fucked up music that happens in this game. This is a, it's supposed to be an underground maze leading to a subterranean society. Well, sounds kind of interesting setting up for it, this particular music. Then it just gets creepy. Now this is the maze. And this is what you get to listen to. Another good example of the music here. This isn't actually the music for the room. This is the music played when you're near an object that has an exubi in it. And you immediately know when you're next to something because the music immediately changes to this particular soundtrack. Now, one of the biggest things that this game accomplished was atmosphere. Nothing in it was actually really that creepy, and as you'll see here, I'm going to show you what one of the Xubi look like. They're really not that creepy at all. In fact, they're kind of terrible looking, and it really brings you out of it. But it's all about the setup and the atmosphere it brings. So, as you get closer to where an Xubi is hiding, it actually starts making a particular sound associated with the element it's hiding in. For example, this one, sand. A little creepy. Now, if I get closer, Now, one of the really interesting aspects about this game is the fact that you actually have a life bar. And every time you encounter an Exupi, well, it takes some of your life bar out. And you can actually die in this game, essentially. Here we got another fine example of music in the room. But, more importantly, I want to show you how each and every exhibit has uh, this button. And, and this button is an explanation of the exhibit. By none other than a twilight voice. Man has taken it upon himself to penalize his fellow man for every conceivable offense, many trivial. Historically, singing insulting songs in Rome. 
injuring a cat in Egypt, and even selling bad beer in Babylon could bring the death penalty. Well, that about wraps up the video portions I wanted to show you guys, and pretty much the review. Overall, this is a pretty classic example of a really well-made and solid Sierra Adventure game, and one of the best in its era, in my opinion. Using a very simple but effective plot, non-linear play, in much the same way Mist was non-linear, very strong puzzle design, greatly inspired by the game The Seventh Guest, and a strong soundtrack that really emphasized the game's creepy atmosphere, as well as incredible screams that helped with that as well. All these elements pull it, really pull it together and make it a very strong game, and remain an outstanding example of non-linear adventure games of the entire genre, and one of my favorite, even more so than Mist, first-person point clicks. Now, this was a, took a new example uh, the last video of a point click, first person point click, and this was a classic example of a first person point click using 2D screens. Mind you, 2D screens is important. Uh, next video, I'm going to do a video of 3D point clicks, transitions, the the whole works. Um, this is a classic example of a 3D point click. Uh, one of the early ones. I think it was came out in 97 or 98 or something like that, but I'll have to check on that when I make the video. But I'm doing the sequel to a game called Beyond Atlantis, and I'll probably end up doing that sometime in the next week or two, depending upon my schedule. So keep an eye out for that. If you'd like to see a full playthrough of this game, go ahead and vote in the comments. Feel free to like or subscribe if you like these videos, as we'll be doing a lot more in the future, especially with summer coming. So, thanks for watching. This is Tall Tale Kill for It's Sir Gentleman.